So far we've looked at a couple of White's less aggressive, what I call non-threatening six move alternatives. But now we will look at something that has to be taken very seriously and what I consider White's possibly most promising method of meeting the Jinji Indian. And I'm talking about 6E4. Let's take a look. In fact, I call this the, quote, theoretical challenge. Why? Because after F5, we obviously have stated our intention to fight for control of the important E4 square. And also, of course, the G4 square. White's 6E4 is just a direct confrontational attempt to meet the Jinji Indian head on. He opens the E file, he offers a pawn, and he looks to keep the line open for his bishop to exploit our weakened dark squares on f6, g7, and h6 on the king side. White's primary idea with this is that after e4, f takes e4, then f3, again in conflict with our e-pawn. White offers a very promising pawn sacrifice to totally get rid of our influence in the center with our e-pawn. And again, our g7 square is pretty weak. Uh, we do have the possibility of queen a5. White's primary idea here is that after e takes f3, knight takes f3, bishop d3, castles, bishop g5, queen c2, and rook at a to e1, he'll have extremely rapid mobilization. Now, of course, black will be trying to do something meanwhile, but this is very easy to play, and this gambit is very dangerous for black to accept. All the earmarks of disaster here. Your king quite often can get hung up. The E file is open. In fact, when this gambit was first introduced, black lost some pretty nasty games. And of course, this led to cries of refutation, Jinji Indian is unsound, and so forth. Even our founder, Roman Jinjin Hashbili, had to put the opening in the garage for a little while to get it repaired. So let's take a quick look, though, at what are some of the drawbacks to this plan that white has. Well, first off, you are sacrificing a pawn with white. And as William Steinitz said, sometimes you take material, not so much with the idea of holding on to it to death do you part, but rather with the idea of returning it at the proper moment in exchange for something else of value. The second point, though, to note is that white has very little pawn cover left for his king. That means that if black ever is able to mount a counterattack, it could be extremely, extremely dangerous for the white king because there's frankly nowhere to run and hide. The third point is, is very much like the same as in the King's Indian and other openings, Yugoslav attack in the Dragon Sicilian, etc., where white plays an early f3, the diagonal h4 to e1 is left open. Since e4 is a logical and dangerous approach for white, you know, which does try to meet the demands of his position, it therefore comes as no great surprise that in a survey of the chess mega database 2010, games that were played, white did score only 54% though. So that's better than in the passive variations, but still not as good as white scores across all openings. And it also shows that black obviously has plenty of resources. So how should black proceed? Well, in the early days, f takes e4, f3. Once it was realized that accepting the gambit was simply too dangerous, black players turned their attention to playing queen a5. And again, this is a move that had stood them in good stead in non-threatening variations. White usually plays queen c2, protecting c3, and putting pressure on e4. Black then started playing knight f6, and after f takes e4, hunkering down with d6. Note that again, knight takes e4, bishop d3, knight f6, of course, queen takes c3, queen c3, knight c3, bishop b2, simply loses a piece for black due to his lack of development and the long diagonal. Therefore, black would have to retreat. But after knight f3, followed by bishop h6, white has exactly the kind of gambit play that he wants. He castles, rook at a to e1, very easy for him to play. In fact, he will hardly even notice he's a pawn down. The black pawn on e7 is so weak, and worse yet, our king on e8 is very vulnerable. In fact, this is exactly how black loses games in the Jinji Indian, getting your king hung up here in the center with an open e-file. So going back after f3, early try for black was to play queen a5. 
and again after queen c2, then to play knight f6 after white takes his pawn back, then just play d6 and start building your barricade. However, after knight f3, knight bd7, bishop g4, knight g4, and castles, Rome decided after some analysis, and I quite agree with him, that this type of position is probably good for white. A bit uncomfortable. So what should black do? Well, Roman began to realize that after queen a5, yes, you do attack the pawn on c3 and threaten it with check, but you simply force white to put his queen on a very good developing active square. Roman gave more and more thought to the position after f3 and realized that a better plan is that black should focus on playing d6 and building his barricade on the king's side right away. The c3 and c4 pawns are not going anywhere, and rather than send the queen off to the queen side, the queen could prove quite valuable in helping to hold key dark squares. Keep in mind, we have given up our dark squared bishop, therefore the queen could be very valuable in holding, helping to fortify key dark squares in the center and on the king side. So his new idea, which we will call the Roman barricade, begins with d6. And after fe4, knight f6, white usually feels compelled to do something about the e-pawn anyway, queen c2, knight bd7, knight f3. Roman's idea was to begin taking control of the e5 square with knight to g4. However, after knight to g4, bishop to e2, this is pretty critical variation for the Roman barricade. And in the book, Crushing White, the Gingy Indian Defense, I devote all of game 34 to analyzing the possibilities here. It's a very rich position, very possible to play. Another approach to the barricading type variation that I came up with is a refinement on the Gingy Indian, is another variation of the Roman barricade type idea, and that again starts with Roman's d6. After fe4, knight f6, queen c2, knight bd7, knight f3, I think knight e5 is also an interesting possibility for black. Again, the idea, similar to the Roman barricade, sometimes this knight drops back to f7 to help fight against this dark squared bishop coming to either g5 or to h6. And after knight takes e5, d takes e5, well bishop d3, I kind of like the move h6. After castles, g5, bishop e2, queen d6, bishop e3, bishop d7, for example, we get a similar pawn structure to what we will see in a game with Almira Skripchenko a little later in this DVD. Here's another idea that's very positional, very solid for black. In fact, Fritz even considers that black is already close to equal. So after f3, challenging the pawn on e4, I've showed you the plans with queen a5, d6, or taking on f3. Now I'll show you the system that I really like. After f3, we've taken a look at accepting the gambit, not a good idea. The early queen a5, premature in my view, I tend to agree with Roman, we need the queen. When white plays actively in the center and on the king side, quite often our queen, being such a valuable unit, is needed to help bolster up until we can get safely ushered off to the queen side or until the game has been decided to some degree. Therefore, the early commitment of the queen on a5 when white is playing so aggressively in the center is probably not a great idea. We've also looked at the Roman barricade idea with d6, and we've also mentioned the idea of knight d7 with the early knight e5. However, now, after having looked at all of those ideas, I will show you my favorite system against e4 followed by f3, and that is the counter strike in the center with e5. This immediately stakes a claim to the center and looks to potentially exploit the weakness that white created by moving his f-pawn. That weakness being the h4 to e1 diagonal. Now against e5, white has tried a number of things. f takes e4 has been played, queen c2 has been played, d takes e6 has been played, bishop e3 counterattacking the pawn on c5, this has been played, d6, looking to box in the bishop on c8, but freeing the c6 square for the black knight has also been tried. Black has more than held his own against each of the various attempts by white, and we will look at a good sampling of games 
to show the different resources for both sides. Going back to 6e4, again the primary idea is that after f takes e4 is f3. However, instead of f3, white has tried a number of other ideas. For example, g4 has been played. The idea there is that the pawn may well advance to g5, thus taking away the f6 square from the knight on g8. However, this also leaves holes behind and further destroys the white pawn cover. 7 g3 has been played, looking to recoup the pawn on e4 at a later date. Bishop to g5, anticipating the knight coming out, a possible d6, has also been played. Knight e2, looking to possibly round up the pawn later with the knight, has also been tried. And the flexible queen c2 has been played. We'll take a look at a sample of some of those ideas at the very end of the chapter on 6e4. In summary, against e4, f3, I highly recommend the system with e5. That will be the major focus of the next several games. But first, we will look at a couple examples of the typical structures from the barricading type ideas.